Act Four, Scene One, The Forest. Enter Rosalind, Celia, and Jacques. I prithee, pretty youth, let me be better acquainted with thee. They say you are a melancholy fellow. I am so. I do love it better than laughing. Those that are in extremity of either are abominable fellows and betray themselves to every modern censure worse than drunkards. Why, tis good to be sad and say nothing. Why then, tis good to be a post. I have neither the scholar's melancholy, which is emulation, nor the musician's, which is fantastical, nor the courtier's, which is proud, nor the soldier's, which is ambitious, nor the lawyer's, which is politic, nor the lady's, which is nice, nor the lover's, which is all these. But it is a melancholy of mine own, compounded of many simples, extracted from many objects, and indeed, the sundry con contemplation of my travels, in which often rumination wraps me in the most humorous sadness. A traveler. By my faith, you have great reason to be sad. I fear you have sold your own lands to see other men's. Then to have seen much and to have nothing is to have rich eyes and poor hands. Yes, I've gained my experience. Enter Orlando and your experience makes you sad. I had rather have a fool to make me merry than experience to make me sad, and to travel for it, too. Good day, and happiness, dear Rosalind. Nay, then, God by you, and you talk in blank verse. Farewell, Monsieur Traveler. Look how you lisp and wear strange suits. Disable all the benefits of your own country. Be out of love with your nativity and almost chide God for making you that countenance which you are. Or I will scarce think you have swam in a gondola. Why, how now, Orlando? Where have you been all this while? You have a lover and you serve me with such another trick. Never come in my sight more. My... Fair Rosalind, I come within an hour of my promise. Break an hour's promise in love. He that will divide a minute into a thousand parts and break but a part of the thousand part of a minute into the affairs of love, it may be said of him that Cupid hath clapped him on the shoulder, but I'll warrant him part whole. Pardon me, dear Rosalind. Nay, and you be so tardy. Come no more in my sight. I had as lief be wooed of a snail. Of a snail? Aye, of a snail. For though he comes slowly, he carries his house on his head, a better jointure, I think, than you make a woman. Besides, he brings his destiny with him. What's that? Why, horns, such as you are fain to be beholding to your wives for. But he comes armed in his fortune and prevents the slander of his Virtue is no horn maker. My Rosalind is virtuous. And I am your Rosalind. <clears throat> There's Celia. And I am your Rosalind. See you, yeah. Sorry, I got lost. Um, eighteen fifty four or so. Uh, let me say it and then she'll go on. Good idea. Yeah. Oh. Can someone read in and we'll just continue and she can pick up? It pleases him to call you so, but he hath a Rosalind of better leer than you. Come, woo me, woo me, for now I am in a holiday humor and like enough to consent. What would you say to me now and I were your very, very Rosalind? I would kiss before I spoke. Nay, you were better first. And when you were graveled for lack of matter, you might take occasion to kiss. Very good orators, when they are out, they will spit. And for lovers lacking, God warn us, matter. The cleanliest shift is to kiss. How if the kiss be denied? 
Then she puts you to entreaty, and there begins new matter. Who could be out being before his beloved mistress? Marry, that should you. If I were your mistress, or I should think my honesty ranker than my wit. What, of my suit? Not out of your apparel, and yet out of your suit. Am I not your Rosalind? I take some joy to say you are because I would be talking of her. Well, in her person, I say, I will not have you. Then in mine own person, I die. No faith. Die by attorney. The poor world is almost 6,000 years old. And in all this time, there was not any man died in his own person, vitalicit, in a love cause. Troilus had his brains dashed out with a Grecian club, yet he did what he could to die before. And he is one of the patterns of love. Leander, he would have lived many a fair year, though Hero had turned none. And if it had not been for a hot midsummer night or good youth, he went but forth to wash him in the Hellespont and being taken with the cramp was drowned. And the foolish chroniclers of that age found it was Hero of Cestus. But these are all lies. Men have died from time to time and worms have eaten them, but not for love. I would not have my right Rosalind of this mind, for I protest her frown might kill me. By this hand, it will not kill a fly. But come now, I will be your Rosalind in a more coming on disposition and ask me what you will, I will grant it. <clears throat> then love me, Rosalind. Yes, faith will I, Fridays and Saturdays and all. And wilt thou have me? Aye, and twenty such. What sayest thou? Are you not good? I hope so. Why then, can one desire too much of a good thing? Come, sister, you shall be the priest and marry us. Give me your hand, Orlando. What say you, sister? Pray thee, marry us. I cannot say the words. You must begin. Will you, Orlando? Go well, to. Will you, Orlando, have to wife this Rosalind? I will. Aye, but when? Uh, but now, as, as fast as she can marry us. Then you must say, I take thee, Rosalind, for wife. I take thee, Rosalind, for wife. I might ask you for your commission, but I do tando for my husband. There's a girl goes before the priest, and certainly a woman's thought runs before her actions. So do all thoughts, they are winged. Now, tell me how long you would have her after you have possessed her. Forever and a day. Say, a day without the ever. No, no, Orlando. Men are April when they woo, December when they wed. Maids are May when they are maids, but the sky changes when they are wives. I will be more jealous of thee than a Barbary cock pigeon over his hen, more clamorous than a parrot against rain, more newfangled than an ape, more giddy in my desires than a monkey. I will weep for nothing like Diana in the fountain, and I will do that when you are disposed to be married. I will laugh like a hyena, and that when thou art inclined to sleep. But will my Rosalind do so? By my life, she will do as I do. Oh, but she is wise. Or else she could not have the wit to do this. The wiser, the waywarder. Make the doors upon a woman's wit, and it will out at the casement. Shut that, and it will out at the keyhole. Stop that, it will fly with the smoke out of the chimney. A man that had a wife with such a wit, he might say, wit with their wilt? Nay. You might keep that check for it till you met your wife's wit going to your neighbor's bed. And what wit could wit have to excuse that? Marry to say she came to seek you there. You shall never take her without her answer unless you take her without her tongue. Oh, that woman that cannot make her fault her husband's occasion. Let her never nurse her child herself or she will breed it like a fool. For these two hours, Rosalind, I will leave thee. Alas, dear love, I cannot lack these two hours. 
<clears throat> I must attend the Duke at dinner. By two o'clock, I will be with thee again. Aye, go your ways, go your ways. I knew what you would prove. My friends told me as much, and I thought no less. That flattering tongue of yours won me. Tis but one cast away, and so come death. Two o'clock is your hour. Aye, sweet Rosalind. By my troth, and in good earnest, and so God mend me, and by all pretty oaths that are not dangerous, if you break one jot of your promise, or come one minute behind your hour, I will think you the most pathetical, break promise, and the most hollow lover, and the most unworthy of her that you call Rosalind, that may be chosen out of the gross band of the unfaithful. Therefore, beware my censure and keep your promise. With no less religion than if thou wert indeed my Rosalind. So, adieu. Well, time is the old justice that examines all such offenders and let time try. Adieu. Exit Orlando. You have simply misused our sex in your love prate. We must have your doublet and hose plucked over your head and show the world what the bird hath done to her own nest. Oh, cuz, 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 my pretty little cuz, that thou didst know how many fathom deep I am in love. But it cannot be sounded. My affection hath an unknown bottom like the Bay of Portugal. Or rather, bottomless, that as fast as you pour affection in it, it runs out. No, that same wicked, wicked bastard of Venus that was begot of thought, conceived of spleen and born of madness, that blind rascally boy that abuses everyone's eyes because his own are out, let him be judge of how deep I am in love. I'll tell thee, Eliana, I cannot be out of the sight of Orlando. I'll go find a shadow and sigh till he come. And I'll sleep. They exit. Act four, scene two, the forest. Enter Jacques and Lords in the mm, habit of foresters. Is, which is he that killed the deer? Sir, tis I. Well, let's present him to the Duke like a Roman conqueror. And it would do well to set the deer's horns upon his head for a branch of victory. Have you no song, Forester, for this purpose? Yes, sir. Sing it. Tis no matter how it be in tune, so make uh, so it make noise enough. <laughs> what shall what he have that kills the deer is leather skin and horn to wear? Then sing him home, have no more scorn to wear the horn. It was a crust ere thou wast born. Thy father's father wore it, and thy father bore it. The horn, the horn, the lusty horn, is not a thing to laugh to scorn. They exit. Act four, scene three, the forest. Enter Rosalind and Celia. How say you now? Is it not past two o'clock? And here, much Orlando. I warrant you with pure love and troubled brain, he hath ta'en his bow and arrows, and is gone forth to sleep. Look, who comes here? Enter My Sylvia. errand is to you, fair youth. My gentle Phoebe did bid me give you this. I know not the contents, but, as I guess, by the stern brow and waspish action she did use as she was writing of it, it bears an angry tenor. Pardon me, I am but a guiltless messenger. Patience herself would startle at this letter and play swaggerer. Bear this, bear all. She says, I am not fair, that I lack manners. She calls me proud and that she could not love me. Were a man as rare as Phoenix. Odds my will. Her love is not the hair that I do hunt. Why write she so to me? Well, Shepherd, well, this is a letter of your own device. No, I protest. I know not the contents. Phoebe did write it. Come, come, you are a fool, and turned into the extremity of love. I saw her hand. She has a leathern hand, a freestone colored hand. I verily did think that her old gloves were on, but twas her hands. And she has a housewife hand, housewife's hand, but that's no matter. I say she never did invent this letter. This is a man's inv invention and his hand. Sure, it is hers. Why, tis a boisterous and 
and a cruel style, a style for challengers. Why, she defies me, like Turk to Christian. Woman's gentle brain could not drop forth such giant rude invention, such Ethiop words blacker in their effect than in their countenance. Will you hear the letter? So please you, for I never heard it yet, yet heard too much of Phoebe's cruelty. She Phoebe's me, mark how the tyrant writes. Art thou God to shepherd turned, that a maiden heart hath burned? Can a woman rail thus? Call you this railing? Why thy God's head laid apart, warst thou with a woman's heart? Did you ever hear such railing? Whilst the man of the eye of man did woo me, that could do no vengeance to me, meaning me, a beast. If the scorn of your bright eyne have the power to raise such love in mine, alack in me what strange effect would they work in mild aspect? Whilst you chide me, I did love, how then might your prayers move? He that brings this love to thee little knows this love in me. And by him seal up thy mind, whether that thy youth and kind will the faithful offer take of me and all that I can make, or else by him my love deny, and then I'll study how to die. Call you this chiding? Alas, poor shepherd. Do you pity him? <laughs> no, he deserves no pity. Wilt thou love such a woman? What, to make thee an instrument and play false strains upon thee? Not to be endured. Well, go your way to her, for I see love hath made thee tame snake, and say this to her, that if she loves me, I charge her to love thee. If she will not, I will never have her unless thou entreat for her. If you be a true lover, hence, and not a word, for here comes more company. Exit Silvius, enter Oliver. Good morrow, fair ones. Pray you, if you know, where is the pearliest of this forest stands? A sheep caught fenced about with olive trees? West of this place, down in the neighbor bottom, the rank of osiers by the murmuring stream left at your right hand brings you to the place. But at this hour the house doth keep itself. There is none within. That nigh may profit by a tongue, and should I know you by description, such garments and such years. The boy is fair, a female favor, and bestows himself like a ripe sister, the woman low and browner than her brother. Are not you the owner of the house I did inquire for? It is not no boast being asked to say we are. Orlando doth commend him to you both, and to that youth he calls his Rosalind, he sends this bloody napkin. Are you he? I am. What must we understand by this? Some of my shame, if you will know of me what man I am, and how and why and where this handkerchief was stained. I pray you, tell it. When last the young Orlando parted from you, he left a promise to return again within an hour, and pacing through the forest, chewing the food of sweet and bitter fancy, lo, what befell. He threw his eye aside and marked what object it presented itself under an oak, whose bow were mossed with age and high top bald with dry antiquity, a wretched, ragged man, overgrown with hair, lay sleeping on his back. About his neck, a green and gilded snake has wreathed itself, who, with her n head nimble in threats, approached the opening of his mouth. But suddenly, seeing Orlando, it unlinked itself, and with indented glides and did slip away into a bush under which bushes shade a lioness with udders all drawn dry lay crouching head on ground with cat-like watch. When that the sleeping man should stir, for tis the royal disposition of that beast to prey on nothing that doth seem as dead. This scene, Orlando did approach the man and found it was his brother, his elder brother. Oh, I have heard him speak of that same brother, and he did render him the most unnatural that lived among men. And well he might do so do, for well I know he was unnatural. But to Orlando, did he leave him there, food to the succot and hungry lioness? Twice did he turn his back, and purpose so, but kindness, kindness nobler than revenge, and nature stronger than his just occasion, made him give battle to the lioness who quickly fell before him, in which 
hurtling from the miserable slumber, I awake. Are you his brother? Was you he rescued? Was it you that so oft contrived to cheat, kill him? Was I. But tis not I. I do not shame to tell you what I was since my conversion so sweetly tastes being the thing I am. But for the black gin? By and by. When from first to last, betwixt us two tears, our recountments had most kindly bathed. As how I came to that desert place in brief, he led me to the gentle duke, who gave me fresh array and entertainment, committing me unto my brother's love, who led me instantly unto his cave. There stripped himself, and here upon my arm the lioness had torn some flesh away, which all this while had bled, and now he fainted, and cried in fainting upon Rosalind. Brief, I recovered him, bound up his wound, and after some small space, being strong at heart, he sent me hither, stranger as I am, to tell this story, that you might excuse his broken promise and to give this napkin, dyed in his blood unto the shepherd youth that he did in sport doth call his Rosalind. Why, how now, Ganymede, sweet Ganymede? Many will swoon when they do to look on blood. There is more in it. Cousin Ganymede. Uh, look, he recovers. I would I were at home. We'll lead you thither. I pray you, will you take him by the arm? Be of good cheer, youth. You are a man. You lack a man's heart. I do so. I confess it. Ah, uh, Sarah, a body would think this was well counterfeited. I, I pray you, tell your brother how well I counterfeited. Hi ho. <laughs> This was not a counterfeit. There is too great testimony in your complexion, and that was a passion of earnest. The counterfeit, I assure you. Well, then, take a good heart and counterfeit to be a man. So I do, but I faith I, I should have been a woman by right. Come, you look paler and paler. Pray you draw homeward. Good sir, go with us. That will I. For I must bear answer back. How you excuse my brother, Rosalind? I shall devise something, but I, I pray you to fitting to him. Will you go? They exit. Act five, scene one, the forest. Enter Touchstone and Audrey. We shall find a time, Audrey. Uh, patience, gentle Aubrey. Faith, the priest was good enough. For all the old gentleman's saying. Uh, a most wicked, Sir Oliver Audrey, a most vile Martex. But, Audrey, there is a youth here in the forest lays claim to you. Aye, I know who tis. He hath no interest in me in the world. Here comes the man you mean. Enter William. It is it meat and drink to, to me to see a clown. By my troth, we that have good wits have much to answer for. We shall be flouting. We cannot good hold. Good evening, Audrey. Good evening, William. Okay. And good even to you, sir. Good evening, gentle friend. Cover thy head, cover thy head. Nay, prithee be covered. How old are you, friend? Five and twenty, sir. Oh, a ripe age. Is thy name William? William, sir. A fair name. Uh, was born in the forest here. I, I, sir, I thank God. Thank God? Oh, a good answer. Art rich? Faith, sir, so-so. Oh, so-so is good. Very good. Very excellent good. And uh, yet it is not. Uh, but it is so-so. Art thou wise? Aye, sir. I have a pretty wit. Why, thou sayest well. I do remember saying... The fool doth think he is wise, but the wise man thinks himself to be a fool. The heathen philosopher, when he had a desire to eat a grape, would open his lips when he put it into his mouth, meaning 
thereby that grapes were made to eat and lips to open. You do love this maid? I do, sir. Give me your hand. Art thou learned? No, sir. Then learn this of me. To have is to have, for it is a figure in rhetoric that drink being poured out of a cup into a glass by filling the one doth empty the other. For all your writers do consent that Ipse is he. Now, if you are not Ipse, for I am he. Which he, sir? He, sir, that must marry this woman. Therefore, you, clown, abandon, which is in the vulgar Lee, the society which in the boorish's company of this female, which in the common is woman, which together is abandon the society of this female, or clown, thou perish, or to thy better understanding, diest, or to wit, I kill thee, make thee away, translate thy life into death, thy liberty into bondage. I will deal in poison with thee, or bestinado, or in steel. I will bandy with thee in faction, will o'errun thee with policy. I will kill thee a hundred and fifty ways. Therefore, tremble and depart. Do, good William. God rest you, Mary, sir. He exits. Enter Karin. Our master and mistress seeks you. Come away, away. Trip, Audrey, trip, Audrey. I attend, I attend. They exit. Act four, scene two, the forest. Enter Orlando and Oliver. Is it possible that on so little acquaintance you, you should like her? That but seeing you should love her and loving woo and wooing she should grant? And will you persevere to enjoy her? Neither call the giddiness of it in question, the poverty of her, the small acquaintance, my sudden wooing, nor her sudden consenting, but, but say with me, I love Heliana. <laughs> say with her that she loves me, consent with both we may enjoy each other. It, it shall be to your good. For my father's house and all the revenue that was old, Sir Roland, will I estate upon you and here live and die a shepherd? <laughs> you have my consent. Let your wedding be tomorrow. Thither will I invite the Duke and all's contented followers. Go you and prepare Eliana. But look you, here comes my Rosalind. Enter Rosalind. God save you, brother. And you, fair sister. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, my dear Orlando, how it grieves me to see thee wear thy heart in a scarf. It is my arm. I thought thy heart had been wounded with the claws of a lion. Wounded it is, but with the eyes of a lady. Did your brother tell you how I counterfeited to swoon when he showed me your handkerchief? Aye, and the greater wonders than that. Oh, I know where you are. Nay, tis true, there was never anything so sudden but the fight of two rams in Caesar's thrasonical brag of, I came, saw, and overcame, for your brother and my sister no sooner met, but they looked, no sooner looked, but they loved, no sooner loved, but they sighed, no sooner sighed, but they asked one another the reason, no sooner knew the reason, but they sought the remedy, and in these degrees have they made pair of stairs to marriage, which they will climb incontinent or else be incontinent before marriage. They are in the very wrath of love and they will together. Clubs cannot part them. They shall be married tomorrow and I will bid the Duke to the nuptial. But oh, 
how bitter a thing it is to look into happiness through another man's eyes. By so much the more shall I tomorrow be at the height of heart heaviness, by how much I shall think my brother happy in having what he wishes for. Why then, tomorrow I cannot serve your turn for Rosalind? I can no longer live by thinking. I will weary you then no longer with idle talking. Know of me then, for now I speak to some purpose, that I know you are a gentleman of good conceit. I speak not this that you should bear a good opinion of my knowledge, so much I say I know you are. Neither do I labor for a greater esteem than may in some little measure draw belief from you to do yourself good and not to grace me. Then, if you please, that I can do strange things. I have, since I was three year old, conversed with a magician, most profound in his art and yet not damnable. If you love Rodland so near the heart as your gesture cries it out, when your brother marries Eliana, shall you marry her? I know what into what straits of fortune she is driven, and it is not impossible to me, if it appear not inconvenient to you, to set her before your eyes tomorrow, human as she is, and without any danger. Speakest thou in sober meanings? By life I do, which I tender dearly, though I say I am a magician. Therefore, put you in your best array, bid your friends, for if you will be married tomorrow, you shall, and to Rosalind, if you will. Look, here comes a lover of mine and a lover of hers. Youth, you have done me much ungentleness to show the letter that I writ to you. I care not if I have. I study to seem despiteful and ungentle to you. You are there, followed by a faithful shepherd. Look upon him. Love him. He worships you. Good shepherd, tell this youth what tis to love. It is to be all made of sighs and tears, and so I am for Phoebe. And I for Ganymede. And I for Rosalind. And I for no woman. It is to be all made of faith and serveth, and so I am for Phoebe. And I for Ganymede. And I for Rosalind. And I for no woman. <sighs> it is to be all made of fantasy, and all made of passion, and all made of wishes, all adoration, duty, and observance, all humbleness, and patience, and impatience, all purity, all trial, all obedience, and so I am for Phoebe! And so I am for Ganymede! And so I am for Rosalind! And so I am for no woman! If this be so, why blame you me to love you? If this be so, why blame you me to love you? If this be so, why blame you, me, to love you? Why do you speak to? Why blame you, me, to love you? To her that is not here, nor doth not hear. Pray you, no more of this. Tis like the howling of Irish wolves against the moon. To I will help you. I will help you if I can. To Phoebe. I would love you if I could. Tomorrow, meet me all together. To Phoebe. I will marry you if ever I marry woman, and I'll be married tomorrow. To Orlando. I will satisfy you if ever I satisfied man, and you shall be married tomorrow. To Silvius. I will content you if what pleases you contents you, and you shall be married tomorrow. To Orlando. As you love Rosalind, meet. To Silvius. As you love Phoebe, meet. And as I love no woman, I'll meet. So fare you well. I have left you commands. I'll not fail if I live. Nor I. <laughs> Nor I. They exit. Act five, scene three, the forest. Enter Touchstone and Audrey. Tomorrow is the joyful day, Audrey. Tomorrow we will be married. I do desire it with all my heart, and I hope it is no dishonest desire to desire to be a woman of the world. Here comes two of the banished duke's pages. Enter pages. Well met, honest gentlemen. By my troth, well met. Um, come, sit, sit, and a song. 
Uh, we are for you, sir. Sit in the middle. Shall we clap and do it around me without hulking or spitting or saying we are hoarse? We are the only prologues to a bad voice. If faith, if faith, and both in a tune like two gypsies on a horse. It was a lover and his lass with a hay and a ho and a hay and on you know that all the green cornfield did pass in the springtime, the only pretty ring time when the birds do sing, hey, ding a ding ding. Sweet love is love, the spring. Between the acres of the rye with a hay and a ho and a hay, none you know these pretty country folk would lie in the springtime, etc. This carol they began that hour with a hay and a ho and a hay, none you know how that a life was but a flower in the springtime. And therefore take the present time with a hay and a ho and a hay, none you know, for love is crowned with the prime in the springtime. Ooh. Uh, truly, young gentlemen, uh, though there was no great matter in the ditty, yet the note was very untunable. Ah, you are deceived, sir. We kept time. We lost not our first time. We lost not our time. By my troth, yes. I counted, but time lost to such a foolish song. Ooh. God by you and God mend your vices. Come, Audrey. They exit. Act four. Scene four of the forest. Enter Duke Senior, Amiens, Jacques, Orlando, Oliver, and Celia. Is the Duke still around? Dost thou believe, Orlando, that the boy can do all this that he hath promised? I sometimes do believe and sometimes do not, as those that fear they hope and know they fear. And to Rosalind, Silvius, and Phoebe. Once more, while our compact is urged, you say if I bring your Rosalind, you will bestow her on Orlando here? That would I, had I kingdoms to give with her. And you say you will have her when I bring her? That would I, were I of all kingdoms king. You say you will marry me if I will be willing, if I be willing. That will I, should I die the hour after. But if you do refuse to marry me, you'll give yourself to this most, most faithful shepherd? So is the bargain. <laughs> you say that you'll have Phoebe if she will? Though to have her and death were both one thing. I have promised to make all this matter even. Keep you your word, O Duke, to give your daughter. You yours, Orlando, to receive his daughter. Keep your word, Phoebe, that you'll marry me, or else, refusing me to wed the shepherd. Keep your word, Silvius, that you'll marry her if she refuse me. And from hence I go to make these doubts all even. Exit Rosalind and Celia. I do remember in this shepherd boy some lively touches of my daughter's favor. My lord... The first time that I ever saw him, he thought he was a brother to your daughter. But my good Lord, this boy is forest born and hath been tutored in the rudiments of many desperate studies by his uncle, whom he reports to be a great magician, obscured in the circle of this forest. Enter Touchstone and Audrey. There is sure another flood of toward as these couples are coming to the ark. Here comes a pair of very strange beasts, which all tongues are called fools. Salutation and greeting to you all. Good my lord, bid him welcome. This motley-minded gentleman that I have so often met in the forest, he hath been a courtier, he swears. If any man doubt that, let him put me to my purgation. I have trod a measure, I have flattered a lady, I have been politic with my friend, smooth with mine enemy, I have undone three tailors, I have had four quarrels, and like to have fought one. And how was that taken up? Faith we met, and found the quarrel was upon the seventh cause. How the seventh cause? Good, my lord, like this fellow. I like him very much. 
God love you, sir. I desire you of the like. I press in here, sir, amongst the rest of the country copulatives, to swear and to forswear, according as marriage binds and blood breaks. A poor virgin, sir, and an ill-favored thing, sir, but mine own, a poor humor of mine, sir, to take that that men else will. Rich honesty dwells like a miser, sir, in a poor house, as your pearl in your foul oyster. By my, my faith, he is very, he is very swift sentences. and sententious. According to the fool's bolster and such dulcet diseases. But for the seventh cause, how did you find the quarrel on the seventh cause? Oh, upon a lie seven times removed. Bear your body more seeming, Audrey, as thus, sir, I did dislike the cut of a certain courtier's beard. He sent me word, if I said his beard was not cut well, he was in the mind it was. This is called retort, courteous. If I sent him word again, it was not well cut, he would send me word, he cut it to please himself. This is called the quip modest. If again, it was not well cut, he disabled my judgment. This is called the reply churlish. It, again, it was not well cut. He would answer, I spake not true. This is called reproof valiant. If again, it was not well cut. He would say, I lie. This is called countercheck quarrelsome. And so to the lie circumstantial and the lie direct. And how oft did you say his beard was not well cut? I, I just no go further than the lie circumstantial, nor he durst not give me the lie direct. So we measured swords and... <laughs> Can you nominate in order now the degrees of the lie? Oh, Sir, we quarrel in print by the book, as you have books for good matters. I will name you the degrees. First, the retort courteous. The second, the quip modest. The third, the reply churlish. The fourth, reproof valiant. The fifth, the countercheck quarrelsome. The sixth, the lie with circumstance. The seventh, the lie direct. All these you may avoid, but a lie direct, and you may avoid that too with if. I knew when seven justices could not take up a quarrel, but when the parties were met themselves, one of them thought but of an if, as if, if you said so, then I said so. And they shook hands and swore brothers. Your if is the only peacemaker. Much virtue in it. Is this not a rare fellow, my lord? He's as good as anything, and yet a fool. He, he uses his folly like a stalking horse, and under the presentation of that, he shoots his wit. Enter Hyman, Rosalind, and Celia. Still music. Hyman. Oh, she's on mute. She's, she's on mute. <laughs> Somebody read it. So I bar confusion. Tis I must make conclusion of these are most strange events. Here's eight that must take hands to join in Hyman's bands. If truth holds to contents, you and you cross shall part. Shall part. You and you are heart. You to his love must accord, or have a woman to your lord. You and you are sure together, as the winter's in foul weather. Whiles a wedlock hymns we sing, feed yourselves of questioning. That reason wonders may diminish, 
how thus we meet and thus we things we finish. Wedding is great Juno's crown, O oh, blessed bound and board and bed, tis Hyman's people's every town. I wed luck wet, then be honored, honor, high honor and renown to Hyman God in every town. If there be truth in light and sight, you are my daughter. If there be truth in sight, you are my Rosalind. If sight and shape be true, why then, my love, adieu. I'll have no father if you be not he. I'll have no husband if you be not he. Nor ne'er wed woman if you be not she. Oh, dear niece, welcome thou art to me. Even daughter, welcome in no less degree. I will not e eat my word. Now thou art mine. Thy faith my fancy to thee doth combine. Enter Jacques de Bois. Let me have audience for, no, that's not, I gotta do, 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 do second brother. Um. Let me have audience for a word or two. I am the second son of old Sir Rolland that bring these tidings to this fair assembly. Duke Frederick hearing how that very day men of great worth resorted to this forest addressed a mighty power which were on foot in his own conduct purposefully to take his brother here and put him to the sword and to the skirts of this wild wood he came where meeting an old religious man after some question with him was converted both from his enterprise and from the world, his crown bequeathing to his banished brother and all their lands restored to them again that were with him exiled. This to be true, I do engage my life. Welcome, young man. Thou offerest fairly to thy brother's wedding. To one his lands withheld, and to the other, a land itself is large, a potent dukedom. First, in this forest, let us do those ends, that here were well begun and well begot. And after every of this happy number that have endured shrewd days and nights with us, shall share the good of our returned fortune, according to the measure of their states. Meantime, forget this newly fallen dignity and fall into our rustic revelry, play, music, and you brides and bridegrooms all, with measure heaped in joy to the measures fall. Sir, by your patience, if I heard you rightly, the Duke hath put on religious life and thrown into neglect the pompous court. He hath. So him will I. Out of these convertites, there is much matter to be heard and learned. To the Duke. You to your, your former honor I bequeath. Your patience and your vir virtue well deserve it. To Orlando. You to a love that your truth faith doth merit. To Oliver. You to your land and love and great allies. To Silvius. You to a long and well deserved bed. To Touchstone. And you to your wrangling. For thy loving voyage is but two months victuated. So to your pleasures. I am for other than for dancing measures. Stay, Jacques, stay. Uh, to see no pastime, I. What you would have, I'll stay to know at your abandoned cave. He exits. Proceed, proceed. We will begin these rites. As we do trust, they'll end in true delights. The dance begins, exit, epilogue starts. It is not the fashion to see the lady, the epilogue, but if it is no more unhandsome than to see the lord, the prologue. If it be true that good wine needs no blush, tis true that a good play needs no epilogue. Yet to good wine they do use good bushes, and good plays prove the better by the help of good epilogues. What a case am I then in then that that am neither a good epilogue nor cannot insinuate with you in the behalf of a good play. I am not furnished like a beggar, therefore to beg will not become me. 
My way is to conjure you, and I'll begin with the women. I charge you, O oh women, for the love you bear to men, to like as much of this play as please you. And I charge you, O oh men, for the love you bear to women, as I perceive by your simpering, none of you hates them, that between you and the women the play may please. If I were a woman, I would kiss as many of you as had beards that pleased me, complexions that liked me, and breaths that I had defied not. And I am sure as many as have good beards or good faces or sweet breaths will, for my kind offer, when I make curtsy, bid me farewell. The end. <laughs> Up, guys nice job everybody so for those of you who are at home watching it well everybody's at home i guess that's a silly thing to say but for those of you who are watching us and not participating in the reading um thank you for joining us tonight thank you for helping to support live theater in whatever form it takes here on cape cod right now and for those of you who are joining us in this cast or watching us from farther away i know we've got what is it, we have somebody from the north shore and i think we've got somebody else from off cape and um Thank you. Thank you for giving us a, an opportunity to entertain you for a little while. Um, as I often say, it's a, it's a phrase I stole from one of my favorite uh, performing partners in the past. Uh, uh, we would never insult you with a rehearsed performance. Um, I hope that you guys had a good time. Uh, if you enjoyed what you saw, please go to Eventide Theater's page on Facebook and like us. Uh, join us this weekend, if you would like, for a play reading. We're going to be doing a play reading of the Kaplan Playwrights Competition award-winning play, Touched by War, uh, which, if I'm looking at this cast, two of our readers tonight, two, yes, two of our readers tonight are actually going to be uh, in that play. Um, and that's actually going to be a really interesting experiment for us because we're going to treat it as a play with entrances and exits, um, and the cast has been working really, really hard. So please join us. Uh, if you like what you see, you'll be able to make a donation if you want to, or you can become a member of our, of our theater organization, become a member of Eventide Theater. Um, we're not gonna be trapped in our houses forever. Pretty soon the doors will open up and the sun will shine again and we will be out there. We'll be performing on stage and in public and we hope that you join us uh, at our theater. But until then, please continue to join us here. Please continue to be a part of what we're doing. Um, and if you have any great ideas, we'd love to hear them. And if you'd like to read with us, um, the plays are open, the roles are open. Uh, we post the sign up list an hour before the show, and it's pretty much a free for all. It's a matter of how quickly you can type. You can jump in and grab the role that you want, and you can read with us. Next week is going to be a lot of fun because we're doing something different, something that isn't very often performed. Uh, as much as this little project is to try and uh, read some of the more obscure Shakespeare plays, the ones that are not done very often, um, next week we're having a Marlowe takeover. So our drop-in Shakespeare is being taken over by Christopher Marlowe, and we are going to be reading Dr. Faustus, mm. um, which, is, which should be an awful lot of fun. Uh, and it's one of those shows that I, do, I never see performed anyplace else. <coughs> Here's an opportunity to hear uh, another piece of art from a, a bygone era uh, from beginning to end, read by professional actors and not so professional actors and amateur drop-ins and hopefully anybody else who's curious and grabs a role before anyone else does. Um, so folks, thank you so much. And at this point, I just want to throw it open to everybody in the cast and say, great job. Thanks for joining us. And, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on either the show or um, the roles or what you thought of this Zoom experience. So have at it, guys. Great work. Chris, Chris, yeah. uh, do you know of a script resource for the Marlowe, for Dr. Faustus? It's actually, it's actually posted already in the event itself. So if you go to our drop-in okay. Shakespeare page and you go to the actual event for Dr. Faustus, there is a link to the script for that. Okay, thank you. And if there isn't, I'll fix it and I'll get one in there for you. <laughs> Thank you. The link didn't work. Oh, then I'll I'll go in and I'll fix it then. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It, it'll definitely be ready by next week. I promise. <coughs> Thank you for oh, putting this together. Everyone. Uh, hey, I love doing this for you guys, and I love that you guys are taking part in this. Uh, so this thank is you. so much fun. <laughs> it, I, it really is an amazing experience, and and to see all of these lovely faces that I miss. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I'm going to learn how to use my system. I'm going to learn how to use it <laughs> the proper way, but I'm better. <laughs> so Toby, doing do great, Karen. I, huh? I would love. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. You're doing great, Karen. Yeah. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. <laughs> So, Toby, I want to ask you, what was it like to do that uh, All the World's a Stage speech? What were you thinking about well, when you saw that come up? Speech. Um, I was uh, thinking about how would Richard Burton do it? <laughs> <laughs> right? I, thought, uh, I thought you sounded a lot like Daffy Duck. but um... <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Always good. <laughs> but I know that you, you got my back. <laughs> <laughs> right. C coming from the clown curmudgeon. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, right, it's wonderful to see all of you guys. And it's yeah. such great fun to do this. It really is. And it's, it's good to see people that I, I don't even know and have them be a part of this. It, it's such a great experience. So I see a couple of faces that I'm not familiar with. We've had a few people who have been back here, but we've got Ed and we've got Katie. Ed and Katie, why don't you tell us where you guys come from and what brought you to our table? Oh, by the way. Katie, you're muted. <laughs> um, Next Thursday. No, no, Karen. We're, Karen, huh? Karen, we're talking to Ed. <laughs> oh. so I want to I I hear how, what brought Ed and Katie to our table because I'm always curious to know where... Uh, the new talent comes from and what, no what attracted them to what we're doing here. Um, we both teach at Massasoit Community College. Um, I actually live up in Waltham, um, but we're also both colleagues with um, Lisa Zenzia Soka. And she's the one who, well, she's connected with you guys somehow. And she mentions that you guys were doing this play reading and I went, oh, I love this play. I want to be a part. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, Katie's done a lot of, Shakespeare before. I am um, fairly new to Shakespeare. I've been doing the theater at home uh, with Katie. Where's the group that, that you, Katie brought me to both this and that group. Um, yeah. I've performed in at uh, mostly at South Shore. I live in Plymouth, but I've performed at Braintree, Duxbury, Hingham, really the whole area at various uh, at theaters and uh, for many, many years. So Plymouth. Um, so a chance to perform the show that I was in got pushed and don't know when it's going to go back up. So this is a chance to be part of something. So I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, Ed has worked with our theater company, uh, the Theater at Hollywood and Vine with Jeff and I. I have. We love him. A lot of fun. Thank you. Awesome. And I've, I've worked with Ed at uh, the Masky River Productions and Pamela there too, which is yes. a lot of good shows. Yeah. There. My home theater group is actually in Somerville. Um, oh. and they're called Theater at First. And they're the group that's been doing the theater at home readings this past couple of weeks. Well, Katie, I would love it if you had an opportunity to share some of that information on our page and let us kind of help promote you guys. And if you guys want to share what we're doing here, um, I've always said, you know, theater is a collaborative effort. Every show, you know, every show is a director, producer, lighting design, costume design, actors, interpretations, perspective, and a theater community is the same way. We've all got to work together and, uh, if there's anything that we can do to help support our friends up in the great north, uh, we'd love to. And if you can do the same for us out here on the Cape, we'd like that as well. Great. Where are you guys? Where's your home? We're based in Dennis, Massachusetts. Dennis. So, okay. Ed, we got to get you to cross this bridge at some point. Yeah, time. I'll Come cross. Yeah, absolutely. Ed, hey, Thank Ed, you. it's not it's not that deep. It's it's uh, it's an easy ride from Plymouth. All right. Well, you know what? He gave himself away when he said Hingham because honestly, if he's willing to drive to Hingham from Plymouth, he can easily drive <laughs> yeah. to Dennis. We're talking about yeah. we're, we're actually probably closer. Yeah. Driven to Braintree from Plymouth, so and Mar and Middleborough, so. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we've got those scary, scary bridges that people have to cross. I know. It's all those cars waiting to get over that scares me. <laughs> They're all well, the only nice scary in the summertime. You can stop at the donkeys and get a coffee. Right. Fair enough. <laughs> this was a great show. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank Thanks you. for joining us. So anybody else have any thoughts or any, uh, any, any insights into their characters? Anybody surprised by some of the stuff they came across? It's such, a good it's such a good play. It is such a good play. I, it's got great parts for women and men. Um, and, you know, it, it just 
works so well as a comedy. I love the music in it. And I, I've, I've seen, <laughs> oh, no, 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 tonight. seriously, I've, I've seen parts, <laughs> seen productions of this where, you know, different uh, eras, the eras, they, they do it, they do the music different ways. So they take the words and they pick a, a genre of music and they play it. And it really just ma elevates the whole, uh, the whole production. Yeah, I saw it in Shakespeare and Company, I don't know, last year or so, a couple years ago, and they almost made a musical out of it. And I was trying to sing along to make it seem like more of a full chorus. But mm -hmm. somebody <laughs> wrote, wrote in the chat, you know, please do not sing. And I thought, oh, go. gee, I think that person <laughs> who wrote that <laughs> left the work. Work. Yeah, you can't. Oh, my. I was trying to make it, you know, sound like a full chorus of everyone having yeah. fun, but someone didn't like it. No, you can't. You can't <laughs> do just it. It doesn't, it just work. doesn't work on Zoom. Yeah, Zoom cuts out the mic. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I got to give you a lot of credit, Pamela. That This show in particular was quite a lift for you. You had a lot of yeah. fun. Oh, yeah. You yeah. did a good job, Pam. Nice job. Uh, thank Very you. I, I have to say, um, I'm not as familiar with this show, so I really didn't know. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you did well. I, I, that was as cold of a reading as you've ever heard. <laughs> no rules, no rehearsal. That's our motto. <laughs> I, I want to um, I want to put in a plug for um, the the wrestling match between Toby and Tim there. In the <laughs> that was yeah. awesome. Yes. That was, uh, very good. Could, and, and good grunts. Yeah, I could before. hear the sound in that one. Sound effects that came across good. I'm pretty excellent. sure I could take you, Toby. Yeah, well, I don't know. I'm pretty, <laughs> I'm trained in stage combat, so, you know. Yeah. Watch out. <laughs> you stabbed me with a rubber knife. <laughs> My husband just handed me a brandy. I'm loving it. Oh, <laughs> nice. the good man. Wow. Good man. one of those scenes where I didn't have much to do, I went and made myself a Negroni, and now it's gone. <laughs> hey guys, uh, thank you so much. Thank you uh, for all of your effort and all of your time. And uh, I hope to see as many of you as we can back next week for Dr. Faustus. Again, it's going to be a unique piece for us. And uh, two weeks after that, we've got our Sonnet Slam. So uh, if you're not familiar with the concept of Sonnet Slam, uh, it's pretty straightforward. You pick your favorite sonnet, you can present it in the style of a slam poet, or you can write your own slam piece if you want to write your own slam sonnet, or just write something and join us. You know, share with us your favorite piece of poetry. It's literally going to be dropping for anybody who wants to. Um, it's truly a free-for-all. Um, think of it as a jazz cafe on Zoom, and we'll just oh, be wow. sitting around clicking. If you want to light up nice. some cigarettes and you want to have some drinks, go for it. Nice. Um, guys, roll. thank you so much. For those of you who are still watching, thank you for being a part of what we're doing here. This is a passion of ours. We have a great deal of love for the art and a great deal of love for the material. Uh, I hope that comes through to you. I hope that you come back and join us again. Uh, thank you for joining Eventide Theater. And to our actors and our readers, thank you so much. You guys have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night. Be well, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>